are continuing to look at um, some Old Testament stories, as we just started last week, that everybody should know. I realized we were in Genesis last time, just looking at some very, very big things, and today we want to stay in Genesis. Obviously, we're not going to continue long in, in the garden, but there are so many foundational things, basic, basic things, we've got to make sure we're all together on in order to really move forward with all of this. Uh, we want to welcome, obviously, anyone who's watching via YouTube, and uh, as always, you're very welcome to join us on a Sunday morning. Um, sometimes you just come across a word that you just like. Um, the title uh, we're going to give today is um, All This Brouhaha Over an Apple. Bru Has anyone ever heard the word brouhaha before? I seriously doubt that Tanya and Leon have come across. I mean, well, maybe they have, I don't know. I have a bruja. I, I, I just sort of said this, and, and I, I thought, well, I'll just look it up just to see if it's a real It's a real word. It's in the dictionary. Do you know what it means? No, what would it mean? I have no idea what it means. Brouhaha means a big to-do, a big deal over what seemed to be nothing. A brouhaha. I don't know, I mean, I think it's from French or something, but uh, I kind of like that word. It just kind of sings. It's nice. Does, there, does anyone else have a, a word you just like? I mean, you just like to say it for whatever reason. Any words? No. <laughs> yeah, I love it. All this brouhaha over an apple. Over an apple. Now, we're going to get into that, but first of all, let me just make sure you totally understand that as we come into this event... The common idea is that Eve ate an apple. apple and do it. Is that true? Is that true? It could have been. But we're not told in the Bible that it was an apple. It was just a piece of fruit. That's all that we know. That's all that we know. Oddly enough, there are some theories that, if you see this little picture down here, what, what is that little picture from? Yeah, apple. Apple. Apple Company. If anyone's got an iPhone, it would be from that company. And there's sort of stories going around that back in the day, and Steve Jobs, who was one of the founders, was trying to come up with a simple idea, and uh, they may have gotten it partially from that story and partially from another story. Who knows? Who knows? But we're going to be looking at this particular event, and did you realize it's an amazing thing? It's an amazing thing as we look at this event how much the impact of one event can have on so much history. Okay, you ready for a bit of a quiz? Quiz hat on? Here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you out some dates of some really big events, and I want you to tell me if you can know what event happened on that day that will actually have a massive impact on the world. On the world. First one. 28th of June, 1914. 28th of June, 1914. Austria, okay. The assassination of Archduke Ferdinand that led up to the First World War. Eric, was that the entire... Of course not. Of course not. There, as most of these things, there's things bubbling underneath the surface for a long time. And that was that, as we say... There may, this may be a, 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 an idiom for Tanya and Liana to take away with them. That was the straw that broke the... Um, <laughs> back. There we go. 25th, 25th of October, 1917. 25th of October, 1917. Bit tougher. Bit tougher. Uh, Russia. The... Someone... Bolshevik Revolution started. How about this one? How about this one? First of September, 1939. First of September, 1939. Invasion of Poland. Invasion of Poland, which catapulted Nazis and beginning of the Second World War. That one event 
led to everything that we know now about the Second World War. 7th of December, 1941. 7th of December, 1941. Oh, Maybe oh. not... Ah, well done, Adam. The invasion of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, Japanese which brought in the American. Americans into the Second World War. Last one. 20th of April, 1962. What's that, Lark? You were born. <laughs> <laughs> Neil's over there. No, 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 no. Neil's got it right. It's Eric's birthday. <laughs> but Neil, very, very nonchalant of it. It's your birthday. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not equating that with all these other things, but I just want to make that make that aware. Things, barring the last one, by the way, barring the last one. Events that led to massive changes in the world had a huge, huge impact. We're going to take a look at this in uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 7, looking at what uh, Tanya had read for us. But first of all, we need to do some very brief sort of setting on the stage. A setting on the stage. We're going to think about this drama. Uh, we don't have time to go into all the details, details, but we want to sort of see what the situation was like coming into Genesis chapter 3. First of all, there is a perfect God. A perfect God. Now, we all, I think, believe by now and understand by now, as we looked at last week, some of the basic bits of who God was, that God is everywhere all at the same time, God knows everything. Did you ever stop and think that these events in the garden we're getting ready to look at, do you think God was, God was aware of what was happening as the story was unfolding? You think yeah. he was aware? Yeah. Yeah, he was aware. I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind for just a few minutes as we get into this. Then there was the perfect man. There was the perfect man. And there may be women in here who say, you got to be kidding. <laughs> there is not a thing. There is not such a thing as a perfect man. And you're right. However, as God created Adam, zero flaws. Can you imagine? <laughs> okay, apart from, I'm sorry. Apart from Chad. So speak for yourself. Yeah, speak for myself. I know. Well, Bethany is soon to find out as time goes on. Yeah. You discover these things. There, there was this perfect creation of God as God had taken that dust and that dirt and had formed this man, breathed into him, as the Bible says, the breath of life. And I wonder, now we don't know the exact details, I wonder where Adam was in this whole drama. I wonder. We'll come to that in just a few minutes. Was he with Eve? No. But then there was the perfect woman. The perfect woman. What was that like? Well, maybe like the perfect man. I don't know. I don't know. But it makes your mind kind of wonder. She was there in the garden, in that incredible perfect place, because not only did the perfect God create a perfect man and a perfect woman, there was a perfect physical environment as well. Perfect physical environment. By the way, within this garden, believe it or not, no weeds. No weeds. Weeds appeared later as a result of the fall of entering into sin. Adam and Eve never had to weed anything in the garden. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great to be able to have all the fruit, all the food you'd want, and never have to get a spade or a thing to pull out the weeds. I mean, Tanya was very helpful. I mean, we have this uh, lavender bush, and I never these weeds grew up in this lavender. I mean, lavender bush is lovely, but you know because of the way it is, these weeds and these bits of grass get in there, and you have to get get your hands into there and pull them up sort of one by one. What a pain in the neck! None of that. Fruit trees all around. There's the banana tree over there, and the and the potato tree over there, and the plum tree over there, and the apple tree over there, and I don't know, the, probably the, the Twix tree over there on that side, and, and all kinds of things. The ice cream tree there in the middle. Incredible. All sorts of things. But there's also, if you remember, 
There's also the tree of life. Now that's a huge study in itself. The tree of life doesn't appear that many times, but it does appear there. Do you know where else it appears? In the book of Revelation. As we see those last events, as God uh, brings out those last events, the tree of life appears in heaven. What an interesting thought. We won't go there. We'll throw that out. The tree of life. But also there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Perfect environment. They were not lacking anything. God provided everything that they could ever want. And we're going to call that the perfect provision. Perfect provision. They didn't have to punch a clock. They didn't have to fill out a single time card. They didn't have to write a single report. Uh, they didn't have to single, send out a single letter to anyone in response to their financial supports. God provided everything physically. He provided uh, Adam to Eve and Eve to Adam. And they could do whatever they want. Well, there was no one to be nosy, right? They had anywhere they could want to go, do anything that they wanted to do in that perfect environment. Do you wish you were there? Do you wish you were Adam or Eve? No. What Janice, what would you say? She's got a lot, they've got a lot to answer for. A lot to answer? Oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. By the, by the, God provided everything socially even. I mean, yeah, yes, I mean, they didn't have big crowds and big parties, but goodness, Adam and Eve, they, 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 they were the perfect match. God created them as he, as he wanted to. And not only that, but God provided, he was there, the fellowship with, with them, as God provided for them spiritually as well. Anything and everything that they could need, God provided. In the perfect environment, to the perfect man, and to the perfect woman. However, also, because we are in England, we have to call it this, we have the perfect baddie. Okay, for Tanya and Liana, the baddie is the bad guy. The bad guy. Satan created as a powerful angel. However, everything that Satan does, he will want to oppose God's work and oppose God's people, that is just who He is. And it, doesn't, it shouldn't surprise us as we come into the story, the things that we're getting ready to see. So here He is. We have to imagine now in your mind, this setting, we're setting a stage now. There's God who created everything. He's watching what is happening. There's the perfect man, the perfect woman, and the perfect environment. God's perfect provision. They lacked for nothing there was the perfect baddie looking to upset everything that God was doing. Surprise, surprise, surprise. So we come now into our text in chapter 3, verse 1. So we're going to call this Act 1, The Temptation. The Temptation. Now for... Some of you have been around me for a few, fair few years, and some of you have. We've been here before, but I need to, I need to, I know, I need to revisit this myself, because this is so, so, so key. The temptation. Let me read again verse 1. It says, And the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So together, we're going to kind of look beyond the words just a little bit. We're going to try to imagine what was going on and be able to put these bits together. So what I'm suggesting here this morning is that as Satan is there, he is probing around a little bit. So we're going to call this the probe. The probe. We already see this little setup of who Satan is. Here was the serpent. The serpent. Okay, Eric, it doesn't say it's Satan. It says he's a serpent. Well, very clearly, as we will see, 
He is identified as Satan, as Satan as well. It appears that Satan is speaking through a serpent. Possibly influencing the serpent. I came across something as I was, as I was studying through this again, that in ancient Jewish thought, now this is, I've never heard this before, but it's interesting, that the Jews had a, had, a, had, a, had a belief in certain areas that every animal in the Garden of Eden could speak. He's the original Dr. Dula. Isn't that amazing? That every animal could speak. Eric, how would they know? I, I, no, there's no biblical proof for that. No biblical proof, but it's interesting. It's an interesting thought. So here it is, whether this is Satan transformed into this serpent, which is very possible, right? Because the Bible says he's transformed into an angel of light. He appears as a roaring lion, all these sort of things. I have no doubt that he could do that if he wanted to, or he could literally speak through this animal. He could come and possess this animal, the serpent, and speak through him that way. We see that Satan does these kinds of things. So he comes now, and he does something, he says some things. But let's stop for just a moment. I want to ask you a question. Let's, let's try to imagine, how big do you think the Garden of Eden may have been? What do you reckon? Big. Big. I, I think big. Eric, how big is big? I don't know. Probably much bigger than my garden, for sure. Probably. But I would, reckon, I would agree with Janice, it must have been big. So you can imagine, there's all the trees and the bananas and apples and the ice cream and the, and the chocolate bars and all these kind of, all these trees all around. There in the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I want to ask you a question. Where did Eve have to be in order to set this up? Where did she have to be? I'm sorry? What do you mean tree of life? Where did she... Where would, okay, if, if a tree of life is there, if a tree of the knowledge of good and evil is there, and all the other trees are scattered all around for however many acres or however many hectares hectare, hectare it was, uh, for this event to happen in chapter 3, where did Eve have to be? She was in the garden for sure. More specific. What now? Close to the tree. Close to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. My question is, if God said in the beginning, you're not meant to eat from that tree, why was Eve even near the tree? Was she just walking by? We don't, we don't know all the details, but I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. I wonder if she walked by several times and she was looking at that tree and thought, hmm. I wonder why God said, don't eat from that tree. I wonder. And maybe the next day or the next week she went by another, another way and she was letting that play in her mind. Here's what, here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. That when it comes to this thing of temptation, it comes to this thing of temptation, you have to be really careful. I want to ask you a question. Do you know yourself well enough? To know where your areas of temptation are. Do you play with that? Do you come so close to them temptation just to prove how strong you are? Do you put yourself in a vulnerable situation? If that's the case, I'd highly encourage you to avoid that. And... Oh, over the years since I've been doing what I do, of course, you know, you get these churches with the big name pastors and all this kind of stuff. The number, the number who have fallen because of what? Mostly because of pornography, having an affair with a church secretary or something like that, is unbelievable. So these blokes... They should have known themselves, but they allowed themselves to get close to the tree. And because of that, they fell. They fell. So that was just my mind. I mean, I can't, I, don't, I can't prove that 
you know, that, that this particular time she was a certain distance from the tree. However, for Satan to be able to say, Eve, look at that tree. Doesn't that look nice? We're going to come to that in just a second. She had to be close enough so that she could look at the tree. She could have been somewhere else. She could have said, you know what? I'm not fool enough to know that if I come close to that tree, it's going to tempt I, I don't want to do that. I'm going to mark a boundary around that tree. I'm going to avoid that area. But that's not what she did. She, she had to be close enough in order for Satan to take these steps. So then, as Satan comes in, notice the words that he says. He says, has God indeed said, did God say this, you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? So Satan plants a seed of doubt. He plants a seed of doubt in her mind. He asks the question, he asks the question, is it true, is it true that God said this? Is it true? This thing about something being true I start to think about quite a bit. It's interesting. The people that are that, that you know, maybe family, maybe people you have worked with, in today's age, are people bothered about what's true? What are people interested in today? And maybe even not today, maybe it's just who people are. People are really interested in what? What makes them feel good. That's what it's all about. People, I, my experience is that people don't really seem to be, don't seem to care about what is necessarily true. It's all about what makes me feel good at the moment and all those kinds of things. I want us to take just a moment now, flip over into the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, please. I want us to visit with someone for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 11. I had an interesting conversation with someone not too long ago. And it made me think of this particular passage. Hebrews chapter 11. Way over there in the New Testament. Hebrews, James. Okay, over there in that direction. Hebrews chapter 11. Are <clears throat> okay, you there yet? Okay, Hebrews chapter 11. Let me read verse 23. Reading just a few verses, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of connect these dots here a little bit. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 says this. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. King's command was to do what? Kill all the boy babies. Moses' parents said no. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to do what? Than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Is sin... Pleasurable. No. Sometimes. Yes, it is. Sometimes. Yes, it is. Sometimes. Is sin pleasurable to the flesh? Yeah. For now, Jesse said for a period of time. It's true. It is. It would be. I know we're in church and we're supposed to be, you know, saying all the churchy right answers. But the reality is, sin is pleasurable. But Moses said he he chose to suffer the affliction or the suffering with the people of God rather than. The pleasures of sin for a period of time. Point being, Moses said, you know what? I want to follow what is true. What God said down, rather than follow what my flesh, what my body wants to do. That's honorable. That's, that's a tough decision. That's a tough decision. And I wonder what people, well, what would people sacrifice for the pleasures of the world? What would people sacrifice for the pleasures of the world? People sacrifice a lot for the pleasures of the world. 
this particular person I was speaking to has a, has a friend, and, and uh, there was a discussion about this thing about Jesus and eternity and, and you know, the battles of, you know, why, why should I, you know, my goodness, it's, isn't life all about having a good time and having fun and, and enjoying this, that, and the other and all this kind of stuff? And why should I even think about eternity? Why should I even think about later stuff? Well, I just want to enjoy it now. That's what it's all about. But Moses said, even as a young man, he said, you know what? That's not what it's all about to me. So Moses, and this is important, Moses chose. Even though, I'm sure, everything probably within him was saying, am I a fool for doing this? But he said, no. I'm going to choose to follow the path of God rather than follow the path of my own flesh, my own pleasure, because it's just for a short time. Because he said, you know what? Following God is for all of eternity. And that, compared to that, far better. Far better. Even though this is pleasurable for a period of time. Back to Genesis. Has God indeed said, did God really say, is it true that ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Here, Satan went to an extreme. Satan went to an extreme. Did God say that you're not meant to eat from any tree? And of course he didn't say that. Well, God did say what? He said you can have from any tree of the garden except that one. You know, God gets a lot of people moaning. And people are like, well, God just wasn't fair. Now, how is God not fair? I thought it was pretty clear. Put down the, the rules pretty clearly, right? And he said, there's only one thing he said that they couldn't do. Everything else, go for it. He said, you can freely eat of everything. Look at all that you can do, all the options. At the one tree, that's all. Just one rule. One rule. Simple. Simple. So when Satan went to this extreme. When he asked the question, did God truly say, you shall not eat of every tree? Did God say that? Let's look at her reply now. Let's look at her reply. Now. Verses 2 and 3. And the woman said to the serpent, and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. She did say that. Okay? God did say that. You may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you should not eat it nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, her words are slightly different than God's words. Let me see if I can spell this out just a little bit. Eve said, we can eat. God allows us to eat. God said, you can have everything you want, so you're absolutely, totally satisfied. But Eve's words were a little bit more, well... God will allow us to eat. But God is much stronger in the words that he said. It almost implies that she really didn't understand all what God was saying, that God was a bit stingy. But wait a minute. Did Eve get it right? Did Eve get it right? Did God say the things that she said he said? Did he get it right? Let me read it again. You shall not eat it. She said, God said, you shall not eat from it, or you shall not touch it, lest you die. Did God say that? Did God say that? Okay. What did God say? You're not supposed to eat from it. God said you're not to eat from it. If you eat from it, you will die. By the way, death means separation. That's a basic meaning of death. We talked about this before. So here's what happened. Eve... Now, we can only know what we have written, or what we see what we see written. Why did Eve add the bit that we're not meant to touch it? I've heard people argue, well, you know what? In order to eat it, you have to, unless you're like bobbing for apples, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I don't think that was in her mind. But she, you know, you had to sort of touch it to eat it. 
But was there anything wrong with touch? Did God say you're not meant to touch it? Now, would, would she have been a fool to touch it? Yeah, she would have been a fool. Because that's not much closer to the temptation. But God didn't say that. He did say, if you eat it, you shall die. You shall be separated. Now, quick question. Did, with the moment that Eve ate it, did she keel over? No. No. Well, what happened then? She did not. We got, she, God separated from her the relationship from that sense. She did die spiritually. By the way, that's how we are all born. That's why we need to be born again. Taken from that phrase in John chapter 3. We need to be, and the phrase means born from above. That's the idea. Because we're all born spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. So Eve said, well, we're not supposed to touch it. We're not supposed to eat from it lest we die. Or we are going to die. Now, I can imagine. Where's God? God's watching us. He's listening to the words. I can imagine, I can imagine in my mind, and I wish I had a video of this. I, wish, I, I, I can imagine God, God may be there listening, watching. He's saying, ah, Eve, why did you say that? Why didn't she know what God said? Why did she get it? Because now we're going to look at what we're going to call the tragedy. Tragedy. Act two, the tragedy. Here's the opportunity. Satan sees, he hears, and he says, Aha! Got her. Got her. Verse four. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows in the day that you eat and your eyes will be open and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Satan knew that he found a weak spot. Eve did not clearly know what God said and Satan went from putting a seed of doubt in her mind to out and out contradicting what God said. Out and out. He said, I've got her where I want her. Here we go. This is going to be good. This is going to be good. We have to realize that Satan opposes God's words. He opposes God. He opposes everything that God wants to do. Notice what he says. He says, for God knows in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened. You will become like God, knowing good and evil. Do you know what Satan is saying? He's saying, really? He's saying, Eve? Really? Come on, Eve. Let's think about this together. Eve, you're not really enough. You're not really good enough as God created you. Surely you want more. Surely you want to become like God. Why? Did he say that? Well, that's what Satan wanted. If you, when you read it in, the, in the Old Testament speaking about the, the few bits that we can try and put together about where Satan came from the Bible says that Satan although God created him as this powerful angel he was still an angel but Satan said that's not enough for me I want to become like God he tried to put himself above God God said hey oh, I don't have any of this And he thought, well, I couldn't get it myself, but I'll get God's crowning creation to think like I am, like to think like I did. Eve, if you just take that fruit, look at it, it's lovely. You can become like God. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. Eve, you're not enough, just like you are. You're not enough as God created you. Surely you want something better. Surely. And can I, can I, can I say, can I say, and I know we touched on this last week, that, you know what, God created us in His image, that you are a person of value, 
that you are important in God's eyes. And God has created every person here with purpose and a plan. The number of, it just it absolutely breaks my heart, the number of stories that I see of particularly teenagers. And teenager isn't teen would you rather would you like to go back and be a teenager again? No. Teenagerhood is tough. It is tough. You're trying to figure out who you are. And today in a, in a battle with all this social media and all those sorts of things that that being a, I think being a teenager today is far more difficult than it's probably ever been. There's so much competition out there. There's so much, so much media, so many things telling you what you should be like, what you should look like, uh, you know, all of these kind of things. And for us, we should understand. Now, I'm not saying don't have aspirations. I'm not, I'm not saying don't work. I'm not saying that. I am simply am saying is that God created you and me with value and purpose. I think Satan started this track that James chapter 1 talks about. Let me just go there quickly as we finish up today. James chapter 1. You're probably familiar with this. James chapter 1. We're going to call this sort of the progression of, of sin. The progression. And this is exactly what, what the track that Satan is going down. James chapter 1 verse 13, reading just a few verses. It says this. It says, let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Here we go. But when each one is tempted, by the way, is temptation the same as sin? No. When each one is tempted, when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then desire has conceived, desire has started, it's, it's, it's bubbling up. It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. There is a progression. There is a progression. We're going to turn back now to Genesis chapter 3, looking at those last couple of verses. I want you to see the progression. What happens? Exactly as James says it. So here we go. Here's the decision in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 3. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she said, oh, I'm not enough. I want to be wise like God. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Was Adam with her the entire time all this was happening? No, it doesn't say. Did she, after she ate, go and hunt down Adam? and said, Adam, look what I found. Yes. We don't know. I wonder. I wonder. However, I could imagine, as God was watching this entire drama unfold, because then verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them, both Adam and Eve, were open, and they knew that they were naked. There was nothing wrong with being naked. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Something God never told them to do. I can imagine God must have been watching and listening. And if God would have been there, I can imagine that in his mind he said, Eve, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But then when she actually took that fruit and she ate it, I can imagine the heart of God must have been absolutely destroyed. The very thing that God created as the thing that He said it was very good, the one thing that God said don't do, she did. So we're going to give you four brief words and we're going to be done. The first word is that of desire. Desire. 
He saw the fruit. It was. It looked delicious. Is there anything wrong with food looking delicious? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. He saw that it was delicious. He saw. She saw the fruit was attractive. That it was pleasant to the eyes. Is anything wrong with that? No. She said that the fruit that the, the, that the fruit that she saw would be able to make her wise. And how would she know that other than believing what Satan said? So then, when all those things start to happen, there is this desire happening within her heart. Desire. And then came the deception. Came the deception. This is the sneaky bit, by the way. The desire is not sin in and of itself. It's the deception bit that really gets us. Eve rationalized in her mind, I'm convinced, Eve rationalized in her mind that surely God would not hold anything back from me that I think is good. Why, being wise is a good thing. Why would God hold that back from me? Maybe God's being a bit unfair. Maybe he's not treating me right. Maybe God was mistaken. So Eve was deceived. Aren't we good at rationalizing things? We make up stories in our mind of how this could be good and that could be good. And we have to be incredibly careful because it's that, that rationalizing in our mind that we convince ourselves that this thing that we're being tempted on we can either handle, or it's not going to be a problem. This is where the problem comes in with the pornography. Why, no one's going to see what I'm doing. And it's just one time. If you talk to those who are addicted to pornography, it all started with one time. Those who are addicted to drugs, those who are addicted to any addiction, any addiction, whether it's gambling or any of those, any of that sort of stuff, it all started with the rationalization. I can control it. I'm strong enough. I can do it. It's only one time. It's harmless. And that's exactly what happened to Eve. She rationalized it. Surely God would want me to have it. And then came the decision to take the fruit, she ate it, she gave it to Adam, the Bible says their eyes were opened, they said, and they said, there, we're naked, we gotta we got, we got do something about this, God never said, God never said anything about them being naked, God created them as he created them. Later, you can find out, for the first time ever, Adam and Eve tried to hide from God, which is never a good idea, by the way. <laughs> doesn't work. <clears throat> they tried to hide from God. But then the last word is death. Seth. Seth. It says The Bible says their eyes are open, they made clothes. And then, as I think Janice, someone pointed out, that God expelled them from the Garden of Eden, the perfect environment, made for the perfect man, the perfect woman, by the perfect God. They were expelled from the Garden of Eden. With that angel, you remember? The angel with the flaming sword, guarding so they couldn't enter in. And from that, we now have weeds coming up, tsunamis, earthquakes, floods, the sin of Adam and Eve, and how we are born in sin, eating Christ as a Savior. From that one event, from that one event, that happened just like that. All this, what happened afterwards. Yeah, I wish I could emphasize every person here that, you know, what we do, what we do, doesn't just affect me. It affects everybody. Okay? That's why as a church, as a church, we need to hold each other accountable. I'm not saying getting each other's business, but we need to encourage one another. We need to watch each other's backs. If you see someone moving to areas that is not 
God honoring. We have, to be, we have to approach it carefully. Don't just run up to someone and, and whatever. I'm simply saying we have to be aware of all these things. So the question I want to leave you with is, have we learned anything from our ancestors? Do we do things just like Eve did, or can we look at that event that started so much and so many knock-on effects? Can we say, you know what? Yeah, I need to learn from Eve. I need to be incredibly careful because I know Satan has a